Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net and today I'm going to be talking to you about systems thinking and the psyche. Alright, so a couple of things that I wanted to mention before I got going with the video. Alright, so first off I wanted to mention that I'll be talking about the psyche more toward the end of the video. So the first part of the video is really going to be all about systems thinking. I really wanted to lay that groundwork down uh, just so that you have a good understanding of that because a lot of the topics that I'm going to be talking about in the future have to do with systems thinking. And so this is kind of the basics of that. Um, also, a lot of the information that I got about systems thinking I did not come up with intuitively. Um, it came from a book uh, called Thinking in Systems, and I'll, I'll write the um, author's name up here uh, when I look it up because I don't know it right offhand. I think it's Donella something or another. All right, another thing that I wanted to mention before I got going with the video is that systems thinking is another one of those relative truths. Um, so it is still a framework that we're placing over the world to understand it better, to make it more comprehensible. You know, but it's one of those things that still works on the level of relative truth and it's valuable in so far as it has a practical function. And it does have many practical functions. So basically, um, one of the main things that it can do is to get us thinking more holistically about a system and then problems within that system, we can find their root causes a bit easier. All right, so to show you why systems thinking might be valuable for addressing root causes and to kind of give you a preview for what systems actually are and how they function. So I want you to imagine that, okay, I'm a human being. You don't really have to use your imagination for that. So I have a human body, right? Now imagine that a foreign system started to act on my body. So there was a disease or a virus of some sort that basically attacked my system and certain symptoms started showing up and maybe the worst symptom that I had was I had this constant hacking cough. And so because I live in a time where we have a lot of medicine and we know the root causes of many illnesses and we've cured many illnesses, there's a good chance that if I go to the hospital, somebody is going to be able to help me out with at least managing my symptoms or with actually addressing the root cause of the problem. But imagine that I lived in a time before science and before we had a lot of medicinal cures for things. So like imagine I'm just a random cave woman and I get the same disease. So there's my body and then there's this disease and they're fighting against each other. And the way that it's expressing itself is through this hacking cough. So if I'm a cave woman and I don't understand anything about systems thinking, what I might assume is that the cough is the problem as opposed to being a symptom of the problem. So I'm going to be trying to do everything that I can to stop the cough when if you know anything about the body's immune system, coughing and sneezing and things are actually helping to expel you know, the, the disease or the virus from the body. So it's your body's natural immune response that's happening. That's the way your system works to try to get rid of whatever is attacking it. So. So if you see, like it can be quite um, unhelpful if you don't look at things through a systemic lens sometimes. Now because science and medicine has made systemic thinking in these ways more clear to us, we don't realize often that many of the systems that our world is governed by um, and many of the systems that are out of balance also can be remedied through use of systems thinking. So for example, if we have some societal problem and we're thinking, well, what's a way we can solve that problem? If we employ systems thinking, then we might be able to actually identify the root cause of the problem and address it right at its roots as opposed to doing some kind of um, symptom management uh, similar to addressing a sickness on the level of the cough. And for me personally, the things that I'm interested in relative to systems thinking would be on the individual level, being able to really understand the psyche and how it works so that people can be more successful with inner work practices like shadow work, being able to integrate. Um, so that's one thing that's interesting to me. And then also on the societal level, being able to integrate certain truths into society to make for a better society. So I think that systems thinking would be a great tool for that type of thing. Well, at this point you might ask, what exactly is a system? What defines a system? All right, so a system consists of parts that work together interdependently to create a complex or sometimes a simple whole thing that produces particular behaviors or has a particular function or purpose. 
All right, so to boil it down to be a little bit more simple, a system consists of parts and relationships between those parts that produce a particular function or have a particular purpose. So in relation to that definition of systems, so we want to think about systems thinking as being a way of thinking and a way of trying to problem solve in a way that accounts for the messiness and sort of ordered chaos that is a system. And in thinking this way, you're also wanting to sort of think in such a way that you recognize that there can be systems within systems and that sometimes systems have effects on other systems which affect even still more systems. So it can get quite complex. All right, so I'm going to go over some basic principles of systems thinking. Now, the first one I find really, really interesting. So this is basically the idea that if a system produces a particular type of behavior, then that behavior has always been latent or dormant within that system from the beginning. You know, it's just that maybe some outside force catalyzed it or maybe some kind of action from within the system catalyzed that change. So, for example, let's take a cave person, right? Now, cave people, you know, you could say that, oh my gosh, you know, it's impossible for a cave person to invent something like a car or like a computer. You know, they're just not living within a society and in a world, and those are essentially systems themselves, they're not living within a system that's conducive to that. But always within human society, always within the world, and always within the human being, there are these latent potentials that can sort of be unlocked the further that humanity evolves our higher nature and evolves in terms of the ideologies that we have, evolves in terms of the structure of the society that we have. So it's these systems that work together that allow us to sort of unleash certain potentials that we were not able to before. But those potentials were always latent in the system. Or another example of this principle of systems thinking uh, would be, let's take the ego. Right? So let's say that a person experiences a trauma and then they have a neurosis that comes up because of it or maybe a full complex with many neuroses. And the thought would naturally be, it's like, oh, the trauma is the thing that caused the neurosis. But no, that's not true because the ability to create that neurosis was always latent in the ego. You could say that the event, the external event, triggered that to happen, but the creation of the trauma actually happened within the ego itself. So that was always there latent as a potential. It just got woken up by some external cause. All right, so the next principle I want to go over relative to systems thinking um, is the fact that systems uh, are counterintuitive and nonlinear, and they're often quite complex. So if we think about our disease example from earlier, you know, and we take away our knowledge of science and our knowledge of medicine and how it works, you know, if we look at it just as it is, you know, it might be kind of an intuitive thing to think, oh, it's like, well, the symptoms are the cause of the problem because they're the things that are bugging me. But at the same time, there's a deeper issue going on that stem far beyond the symptoms. All right, so I'll talk about this next one a little bit more in depth later, but that systems can act as parts within other systems. So essentially what we have in the universe is we have a very large system that is the universe and we have tons and tons and tons of smaller systems that exist within it and then many many smaller systems that exist within those systems and so on and so on so there's a, a very complex array of many systems working together in reality alright so another facet of systems thinking is that basically a system is responsible for its own behaviors so we might be tempted to think that let's say if some kind of some outside force triggered some behavior in a system that somehow it's the outside force that caused that but it's not the outside force that causes it even if it's triggered by that it's something that's already latent within the mechanism of the system that makes it come up so a system causes its own behaviors and again that's kind of riffing off of that first principle that I mentioned alright so if we take a look at this idea of a system being responsible for its own behavior and we look at Europe in the 1930s, um, you know, we might look at the things that came thereafter, you know, in terms of, you know, World War II and the rise of Hitler and the Nazi regime. And we might look and we might say, oh, Hitler, he was the cause of that. And it's like, well, in a sense, yes, from within the system, maybe. 
But you have to understand that uh, Hitler was part of a greater system that already had those behaviors embedded in there. So basically, Hitler as part of the system catalyzed all of the other things that happened within the system. There was a particular um, almost way that things were that allowed for those um, events to rise up. Now, um, kind of a similar idea is the idea that if somebody's holding a cup, let's say, and it's filled with, I don't know, um, grape Kool-Aid, you know, you're not going to be able to bump it and make Coca-Cola come out of it because it just doesn't have that in there. So it's the same kind of principle that if the, if the behavior wasn't already latent in the system, if nothing from the outside is going to make it so, it was already there to begin with. So another principle of systems thinking is that a system basically can have the same parts, right? So if we have two systems and they both have the same parts, but if the relationship between those parts is different, it's going to be two totally different systems. You know, so in this case, it's the behaviors and the functions of those behaviors are important, so important that they change the entire structure of the system if they're different. Another thing about systems is that they are essentially ordered chaos. So systems are like very, very messy and very nonlinear, like I had mentioned before, but they have a kind of order to them. So this is why I had said in my previous video about yin and yang that all systems require the conjunction and integration between yin and yang to be a functioning system because that's essentially what a system is. It's chaos in an ordered form. All right, so another principle of systems thinking is that a system basically has a function or multiple functions. And one of the main functions of a system would be to keep itself alive. So it wants to maintain the status quo of itself. It wants to keep itself in the mode of homeostasis. That's what it tries to do. Also, the problems that happen within a system are essentially non-personal. As in, you couldn't necessarily point to one single individual player within the system and say, it's all your fault. And I think people have a tendency to want to reduce things down and to lay blame at particular um, people or particular circumstances when really a problem usually stems from a lot of very complex things coming together to create that problem. So, you know, it often becomes better to think of these issues as like an invisible hand issue, even if there are particular perpetrators, you know, you want to think about it as an individual hand, uh, invisible hand issue because essentially you're going to be then able to notice that, oh, maybe this social pattern led to that, maybe we can tweak that a little bit, or maybe this pattern over here led over to this, you know, maybe we can tweak that a little bit. And so we get a better idea for what may or may not work in the future if we want to avoid similar problems. And also the main place that we want to be looking is not outside pointing fingers at this or that or the other person is to look inside and to see how we're actually contributing to the, the system that causes certain problems. So I just mentioned a moment ago that a system consists of three main facets. That would be the parts, the relationship between the parts, and the function or purpose of the system. All right, so one of the things that I want to focus more on is the, the middle one, the one about the relationship between the parts, because that's a little bit more nebulous. Oftentimes, the relationships between the parts can be quite invisible. So I think the best illustration of the importance of the relationships between parts would be in the form of chemical reactions, where essentially you have the same atoms no, ma no matter what, but the relationships between those atoms change and essentially create a brand new substance, which would be a brand new system. All right, so an example of a chemical reaction would be what happens during photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis itself is a system, but we could also say that each molecule that's involved in the process of photosynthesis would also be its own system. So in order for photosynthesis to happen, what happens is that the plant absorbs the sunlight, it also absorbs water, which is H2O, and carbon dioxide from the air that we breathe out and that other animals breathe out in the form of CO2. All right, so these are what those uh, particular molecules look like. So what you'll notice is that you have the particular atoms. So we have, let's say in H2O, we have two hydrogen atoms and we have one oxygen atom. And we have them bonded together by those little lines that go in between um, 
each of the atoms. So that means that that is H2O, that is its own molecule, it creates its own substance in the form of water. So the same thing goes with the CO2. So we have one carbon atom, and then we have two oxygen atoms, and those are bonded together similarly to create carbon dioxide. All right, so what happens when the plant absorbs this and the sunlight at the same time is that those bonds in between those atoms, the relationships in between those atoms change. So they break apart the atoms and they reconfigure to create a brand new substance. So if we have lots and lots of those different types of molecules, what will eventually result is a chemical compound called C6H12O6. And C6H12O6 is the chemical name for glucose, and glucose happens to be what a plant eats. And so that's the importance of the relationship there. And once that relationship switches, now we have a new system in the form of C6H12O6 and in the form of glucose that has a brand new function, and its function is to feed plants. All right, so the main takeaway here in looking at this example is just exactly how important the relationships between parts are. So you might think that, oh, well, if the parts in this system and the parts in that system are similar, then essentially you're going to have about the same function, when that's not true at all. So if we look at CO2 and H2O, they both have a lot of oxygen in them, but at the same time they're two totally different compounds. So I have a chemistry joke uh, related to this, so you might have heard it before. All right, so two chemists walk into the bar, and one orders an H2O, and the bartender gives it to him, and he drinks it. And then the second chemist says, I'll take an H2O2. And then the bartender gives him his drink, he drinks it, and then he dies. Because H2O2 is a totally different substance from H2O. H2O2 is actually hydrogen peroxide. So again, we have parts, the relationship between the parts, and then we have the function or the behavior that the system produces. All right, so what I'm gonna do next is post up some examples of systems on the screen so you just get an idea for what counts as a system. All right, we have the ecosystem, a society, humanity at large, the cosmos at large, a solar system, the human psyche, the human body, an ant colony, a beehive, the stock market, an atom, a molecule, a disease, a tree, a forest, a car, a computer, the internet, an addiction, a neurosis, a complex, the human genome, the precipitation cycle, photosynthesis, a corporation, a highway, an assembly line, the breath cycle, a life, a world view, an ego, and finally the ocean. So even though a system consists of parts, relationships between those parts and their function, a system itself can function as a part within another system. Right, an example of this would be the human heart. So a heart has parts, so in the, the form of ventricles and arteries and and even the blood, I guess, could be considered part of the heart system. You know, and they all have a specific relationship to each other and a very specific one at that. And the function of it all is to pump blood through the veins so that it carries oxygen all throughout your body. But despite the fact that the human heart is a system, it is also part of a larger system. So the parts of that larger system of the human body would be like the heart, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, and all of the other internal organs and all of the other things that make being a human being possible. And those things all have a very specific relationship to one another. And again, it's important that it's specific because if you had things any other way, it just really wouldn't work out. But the function of all of those systems working together is to keep the human body alive. All right, so now for my stated purposes, 
Um, I'm most interested in systems thinking regarding the ability for integration on the individual level. So if we look at our psyche, you know, we can recognize that our psyche is itself a very complex system. And so if we understand how that complex system works, then we might be able to address some of the issues that we have better because we can understand that there are things that are unconscious and we can sort of be able to do our shadow work and all of our other inner work just a bit more effectively if we understand the way that system works. And I'm also intrigued at the possibility of taking that almost on the macro level and to help society as a whole with their problems because Essentially, a society functions almost similar to the way that the human psyche functions. You know, you find that a lot of things that, you know, would be like, let's say, as a repression on the level of the individual uh, human psyche uh, would be almost like a repression on the greater society. You know, and there's all kinds of latent potentials within the psyche, and there's a similar parallel to latent potentials within society. So I'm really, really interested in basically um, being able to, in a sense, pinpoint the deepest barriers to our progress as humanity and to be able to remove those so that we can naturally expand our consciousness as a whole group of people. So I'm really interested in those two possibilities relative to systems thinking. Also relative to that last point, I talked a lot last week in my video about how all systems require yin and yang to function. So it's basically this, the combination between these two subtle energies that creates a system. So this I'm going to actually get more into in the next video where I talk about how society generally has a habit of repressing and constricting the flow of yin. And so I'm not going to mention that in this video, but just so that you know for the future, I'll be also talking a little bit about systems thinking within that and to see how we can kind of like fix that problem, at least on the individual level, but maybe to brainstorm some ideas about, you know, what might help people um, sort of integrate yin into their lives a bit more. And in fact, systems thinking itself is quite a mixture of yin and yang because it requires a certain degree of analysis, which is very yang, but it requires also holistic thinking, which is very yin. So a lot of times we have a tendency to approach problems at a yang level because again, a lot of our things are very yang oriented and imbalanced in the favor of yang. And so if we do that, we won't really be able to understand systems. We can understand reductionism and logic, but not so much holistic systems. But now that I've explained the way that systems thinking works and you know how a system generally works, now we're going to look at the psyche through the lens of systems thinking. And so for this part of the video, I'm basically going to set you up a basic model for how the psyche is through the Jungian uh, psychological model, which I find actually to be quite accurate, you know. Now, of course, you know, it is just a model, so it's an idea overlaid onto reality. So in reality, um, the mind doesn't have these kind of clear delineations and boundaries like this. but it is a good proximity and it can help us really start to understand how the, the psyche works together as a mechanism. All right, so in the Jungian psychological model, we have the ego, which is basically the, the control center of everything. It's what we think we are. It's that bundle of thoughts that we're identified with and we think of as a me. All right, and then we have the persona, which is basically the social mask that we wear. So oftentimes ego and persona are quite related. So if we have our ego set in a particular way, we generally like our persona to be a reflection of that ego, you know, unless we think there's something that other people won't accept or something. So for example, if you identify with being a metalhead, let's say, then you're probably going to want your persona to in some ways match the archetype of a metalhead. All right, so that's persona and ego. And then we also have the shadow. That's where everything gets uh, relegated to that, you know, the ego sees as a threat to itself. 
So for example, uh, let's say I'm a metalhead and I'm like very, very, like a purist metalhead. I don't want to listen to any other type of music. But then I find myself like tapping my foot one day to some Britney Spears. But this is a huge problem. This like is like an existential crisis. So I got to push that back into the shadow because that's just too dangerous. You know, if I have this really, really strong identification as a metalhead, that's dangerous to my whole entire thing. And then my persona is all a lie. So, you know, just to maintain that integrity, you know, it gets pushed back into the shadow. Then we have the anima or the animus, which is sort of the opposite gendered um, archetype within ourselves. And it's the closest thing to what's called the self, which I'll talk about in just a moment. The self is basically the biggest thing that there is in the psyche. So basically when it comes to the anima or animus, um, the theory goes that if you're a man, you're going to have the anima, which is the undeveloped feminine in you. So it, like if you orient more masculine, you're going to have the anima there. And if you orient in more of a feminine way, you're going to have the animus there. So I would say that most of the time you can expect this to kind of travel along gender lines, but I have experienced anima possession in the past. So I don't think it's necessarily super rigid, like, you know, definitely going to be like based on your gender, but most of the time it probably will be. So what happens with the anima and animus is that if you, um, if you basically accept your anima and animus and you integrate it, what it'll do is it'll give you sort of access to wisdom from the collective unconscious. Then we have the self, which is spelled with a capital S, and this is basically who we are beyond ego. So if we don't identify with our ego and we don't identify with the aspects of our persona or anything, you know, and we see that we are the whole entire thing, you know, essentially that's what we're connecting with is what we actually are, the truth of what we are. So basically this is the same kind of idea as, you know, enlightenment. It kind of, in my experience, when I had my ego transcendence experience, it did kind of work that way is that, you know, basically the ego dropped away and then all of these awarenesses came up, including my awareness that essentially I was a thread in the tapestry of God and that I was experiencing God as a, myself. So, um, so the self is basically what's, what's deepest in the psyche, what's underneath all everything else that's individual. Now let's say that we didn't have any awareness of how the psyche worked, you know. Let's say that I didn't just tell you about the Jungian psychological model and you haven't been watching my channel about the ego transcendence or anything like that. So we essentially are kind of as blind to the, uh, the workings of the psyche as a system as, let's say, a cave person would be to the workings of the disease that I mentioned earlier. So essentially, you know, we might try to address the problem on the level of the symptoms. And I see this happen very, very often where people will experience, let's say, a neurosis or a problem and they'll try to solve it in some surface level way that's never going to get at the root of the problem. So for example, let's say that we have a problem with social anxiety and we have these fears of coming off particular ways. Um, in front of people, you know, we're afraid people are going to think we're awkward or weird or creepy or whatever, you know, and so we have this debilitating problem and so we're like, well, how do we solve that problem? And then they start looking at, you know, the psyche, uh, not the psyche, but the, the persona, you know, it's like, oh, well, how can I come off where I'm not going to come off like I have social anxiety? You know, that's going to solve the problem. If I could just, you know, not be as awkward or weird, then I wouldn't have social anxiety. But no, that's addressing things on too much of a surface level kind of way. Usually the problems like that, that, that plague us, come from certain aspects of ourself being repressed away to the shadow and just generally being unconscious of the deeper causes of our problems. And in a sense, awareness itself is healing. If we can integrate that into our consciousness, things kind of even out. And sometimes things just drop away without us even trying to address that particular issue. So to give another example, let's say that we fear being seen as inferior. And so again, we might look at our persona, on, which is again, shallow level, this is our social mask, 
you know, if we look at our lo the level of persona, we're like, oh, well, I have to come off in such a way where I don't look inferior. You know, I have to prove myself and show that I'm actually superior or that I'm just okay, you know. So there's like trying to sort of solve the problem from the outside in, which is a huge problem because it doesn't actually address the deeper causes of the problem. What you really have to do is you have to actually go down into the shadow and figure out why it is that you have such an issue with inferiority and it usually has to do with either traumas, like if we have limiting beliefs that we just believe really, really strongly, but we're just, we believe them so strongly that we don't even know that they're beliefs. That can be the cause of many different neuroses on the surface, you know, or just residual emotional pain that exists not even in the psyche, but in the body. So there are, um, there are tons of different uh, ways to address the problem that don't exactly don't exactly come in a rational way so like if you're not aware of the mind and the body as deeper systems then you're you're going to totally miss those solutions also um, relative to trying to address this issue at the level of psyche um, social media I see is kind of um, kind of showing us a different and more clear version of this social uh, of this psychological pattern so basically people on social media often you know they try to present an idealized version of themselves through pictures and an idealized version of their life through like you know just taking pictures of the best times and posing things just so um, you know, and they just have very particular ways of communicating that they might not be able to articulate um, in life um, due to maybe lack of natural charisma, but they can put it a certain way in writing and it sounds better. So they're basically projecting this ideal image in the way that they would be doing with their own in-life persona if they had the capacity to do that. So again, it's the same uh, kind of thing with the solution being from the outside in instead of like actually addressing what's going on inside to cause the desire to come off in, in such an idealized manner. But if we understand that the psyche is basically a complex conglomeration of those five aspects and all of the thought processes that go into those five aspects, so even the ones that are conscious, unconscious, and subtle, so all of those together is what creates the psyche. So if we have an idea of the degree of complexity that the psyche has, we have to then figure that maybe our solutions have to be um, kind of complex and counterintuitive as well. But there's also an understanding that makes it a little bit simpler. So basically, one of the things about the psyche is that it's always trying to bring itself into a state of wholeness. So reintegration is kind of its natural set point. So Basically, all you have to do is remove the barriers to integration, to integrate it. It's not like you actually have to dredge up the particular traits and then manually put them back in the right place. It's just you remove the barriers and just like water flowing into a place where there's no more obstruction, it'll just go immediately there. So that's kind of its own state of entropy. The, so the psyche is geared toward reintegration. Now, on the other hand, we have an ego, and the ego is geared toward the opposite. The ego is geared toward individuation. So basically, it wants to have this selective identification and a pushing away of the things that it doesn't want associated with itself. And it is actually the cause of all suffering, but it's what it's designed to do. It's designed to keep you selectively identified so that you don't realize that there is no distinction between yourself and anything else. It's basically meant to keep you um, very locked into this one single position within the psyche. So the ego's main function is to gather concepts to itself and to push concepts away from itself and into the shadow to sort of maintain a sort of homeostasis and to kind of maintain itself. And then again, the psyche's natural movement is toward reintegration and so these two forces clash against one another and so they kind of create a homeostasis all their own and there's this huge struggle always going in is that your your mind and all of the aspects of it are trying to reintegrate it's just the ego doesn't want to let them do it 
So this is why when the ego drops away, it essentially gets rid of all of the barriers and all of the things that had been repressed, including your knowledge of the self with a capital S, sort of come to the forefront within the psyche and actually get reintegrated into your consciousness. And then you have that connection with your conscious mind and the self, which is basically God. And so that's why enlightenment is associated with an expansion of consciousness and so much more awareness and that connection with God. You know, and of course, I wouldn't say that this is the only factor, perhaps there could be other ones, but it just makes perfect sense to me and it does mirror what I experienced when I had transcended the ego. Now, as I've said in past videos, you know, you don't need to transcend the ego to actually reintegrate. There are ways to reintegrate even if you're ego identified and I highly recommend it even if you're someone who's on the path seeking enlightenment because that's going to make the task a bit easier because you'll be bringing more of yourself to the table. All right, so I want to basically give an analogy of how uh, shadow work and systems thinking are kind of similar. So I want you, I'm going to paint a picture for you so it's going to be a very visual example. So I want you to imagine that you're standing right next to a lake and this giant lake is very dark and very murky to where anything that is anywhere below the surface of the lake is completely unconscious to you. You can't see it, you can't see any fish swim, you can't see anything. All right, so that lake represents the shadow. So once something is relegated to the shadow, it is not possible to be witnessed by the, um, by the conscious mind. It's just not integrated. Then imagine that this giant shadow lake has like tons and tons and tons of buoys in the lake. Some of them are above the surface and some of them are below. So the buoy represents particular aspects or traits that we have and the buoys that are above the water are the ones that are naturally allowed to float to the surface and the ones that are below the surface are the ones that we are unconscious to. Now within this lake, we wouldn't be able to see this of course because it's underneath, there's a complex system of anchors keeping certain of those buoys pulled up underneath the water because in, like the buoys naturally want to come up that's like just something inherent to buoys they want to go upward that's what they do but what happens is that those anchors pull those buoys down underneath the water and so we have an obstacle in their way to actually going up to the light of consciousness so that system of anchors that complex system is like the ego now the ego, if we make an analogy to the ego, it's not going to be um, anchors that you know are nice and neat and work together in a way where you can look at them and you're like, oh, well, obviously that works that way. These are going to be kind of complex and gnarly and difficult to disassemble. So what you would actually have to do if you're going to try to disassemble those anchors in hopes that more of those buoys go up to the surface, which is our goal in shadow work, you know, to make more of those traits come to the surface of consciousness, what you have to do is you have to dive down into the shadow lake, feel your way around in the dark, and then try to dismantle um, some of those anchors. And sometimes the result can be quite counterintuitive. So sometimes you'll be dismantling what you think is a certain uh, buoy, let's say, Let's say that you're like trying to get a certain one to rise to the surface and you so you go down under and you're trying to untie that but then another one over here gets tied up so new things come up. Or sometimes it requires a lot of different anchors to be taken apart just to get one buoy to float up. That's what happens when let's say we have a complex. So if we have a particular neurosis that is really a complex and that would be a bunch of different things working together almost as a system of neuroses working together to create a bigger problem and so with that we actually have to undo the anchors maybe in multiple places for those to sort of rise up to the surface so for example if we're dealing with a complex and one of those buoys that we're trying to get to rise to the surface is the fact that we have a lack of self-confidence so we want to integrate the aspect of ourself that is confident 
but let's say for example we're trying to untie this anchor over here but it requires a ton of other anchors to be untied for that buoy to actually float up to the surface so there can be a bunch of different things getting in the way from you know something that's very overt like a severe trauma or something that's very subtle like just the adoption of like a, a minute belief that you didn't even know that w was going to cause a problem you know so these types of things you know are the things that you're going to be trying to dismantle i'll go into that in just a moment or sometimes what will happen is that we'll remove an anchor and then all of a sudden a ton of stuff a ton of buoys start just rising to the surface now this sounds like a very good thing like oh i hit the mother load yes i'm i'm reintegrating everything but if too much happens at once this can be quite the shock to the ego and so what happens is i call it like the turning over a rotting log effect you know, so imagine that you were just like sitting on this log and you'd been sitting on there forever and doing whatever on it. And then like you turn it over and then all of a sudden there are maggots and it's rotten and there are spiders crawling out of it and centipedes and all of the nastiest things that you could imagine. And you know, you'd been sitting on it the whole time and you had no idea that all of that was there because you didn't know it was rotten. And so like I said, this can be quite a shock to the ego and the ego can get scared and kind of have a backfiring effect where it doubles down and even represses more. So you want to watch out for that and if you end up with a lot of stuff coming to the surface at once, try to relax into it and try to accept it because it'll be in your best interest not to resist. So you might be wondering at this point, like what are those anchors consisting of? So we know ego, but you know, ego isn't real in a sense. But so I've always described ego as kind of like a thought process that's always going. And so basically everything that causes ego is basically beliefs that are clung onto too tightly or just beliefs that we can't set down that we kind of assume are just like reality. So if we don't know the difference between beliefs and reality, we can often get confused and that can add to the strength of our ego. Um, or we have you know certain thought processes that always come up and that are self-referential um, or just obsessive thought processes in general that kind of distract you away from realizing that this isn't the full extent of the self sort of like the thought stream kind of pulling you back into it over and over again then we have various protection mechanisms uh, protection mechanisms put out specifically by the system of ego to protect itself and to maintain its homeostasis and then extra protection mechanisms on top of that if we've ever experienced any traumas so you know we might develop certain beliefs or certain habits or certain ways of thinking about ourselves because of various traumas then we have our worldview in general and our perceived relationship to it. So this is why I always advocate for having a worldview that breathes, you know, being able to understand that you really don't know how the, um, how the world works. You really don't know how reality works at all. And so essentially as a human being, you're kind of in a blind spot. So you have to really accept that you can't know, don't know, and, that, and that's perfectly okay to be in that place of uncertainty. And then the crux of everything is the belief in the I thought, the thought that I am this separate person from everything else in reality and I'm this particular person with these particular likes and dislikes and here's my thought stories about who I am and where I've been and what my past is and where I want to go and like all of that kind of self-referential thought where we are you know, solidifying the illusion of being a particular self. All right, so a way to kind of almost weaken the pull of these egoic thought processes and to kind of loosen those anchors, so to speak, would be like just number one, stealing energy from them. Like, so you're, you're taking your awareness and you're taking them out of the thought stream that carries those ego ideas and you're putting it on some other tangible experience like the, the sensation of the breath on the nostrils or the feeling um, of the sensations going up your spine. So, or, you know, maybe even a particular visual stimuli or an auditory stimuli or, you know, whatever it happens to be, 
basically the idea is you're putting your focus on something concrete to avoid being swept away in the thought processes that create the illusion of ego. Also, separating the wheat from the chaff when it comes to identifying beliefs and truths that we know. And so essentially what you're going to do is you're going to basically pull that artichoke apart until there's nothing there. You know, because essentially everything that we have of reality is really just in this one present moment and everything else is a memory that occurs in thought. And, you know, basically all of our ideas also occur in thought. So everything that we know is happening right now and now and now and now and now. And so you see, it's very, very difficult to even find that now. So that's like a razor thin area that actually is the present moment. So there's so little that we know. So if we can separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of beliefs and reality, that's very important. Also practicing brutal honesty with ourselves. you know, even if it paints us in an unflattering light, um, or, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, just recognizing how little you can know as a human being, you know, how we're ultimately in this huge epistemic blind spot. Now this is good advice for shadow work and it's also good advice for weakening the ego structure in general. So if we take our same analogy here with the shadow lake and with the buoys and with the complex anchor system, basically what transcending the ego does is it basically just makes all of those chains, those anchors turn to dust. So all of those buoys go up to the surface and those are the individual human traits and then that lake totally clears so you could see down to the bottom of it. So it's like you have your whole entire self coming to the table because it's all buoyed up and then you can see exactly what your connection is to the divine and you're just so much more conscious because everything's at the surface of consciousness and the entire lake is clear. So this is why transcending the ego or dissolving the ego is associated with an expansion in consciousness. Now it's all always been there but you just haven't been able to see it. Alright, so that's all I have for you for now. I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and subscribe to the Diamond Net and go ahead and click the like button below. Also, I wanted to say thank you again to my patrons. You guys are awesome. And that's all I have for now, but until next time, keep becoming more you. Mm -hmm.